to kindly take your seats. We would like to begin. Thank you. Su Excelencia, His Excellency Pedro Sánchez, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, Mr. Hosing Lee, Madam Patricia. Espinosa, distinguished delegates, ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests. It's a great pleasure for me to resume the first plenary meeting of the 25th session of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP25. The opening of this conference here in Madrid under the presidency of Chile and held in Spain is testimony to the extraordinary things that multilateralism can achieve when we work together towards a 
common goal. May this be the inspiration that drives our negotiations over the next two weeks. This morning, it's a great honor to have with us His Excellency Pedro Sanchez, Prime Minister of Spain, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General, Mr. Hosing Lee, who is Chair of the IPPC, and Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, science is fundamental in order to draw up policies on climate change. That is why I would like to invite Mr. Hosing Lee, who is chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to address the plenary. Mr. Lee, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to address you on behalf of the IPCC at this opening of COP25. I'd like to express our gratitude to the government of Spain for hosting this important conference and to the government of Chile as COP president for all their preparations. Let me start by reminding you that our IPCC assessments show that climate stabilization implies greenhouse gas emissions must start to peak from next year. And, but emissions are continuing to increase with no sign of peaking soon. As Secretary General mentioned, we are clearly in a crisis. Our three special reports on the warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, climate change and land, and the oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate, indicated that the impacts of current warming are much more severe than previously understood. For example, accelerating sea level rise, ocean warming, some key ecosystems becoming much more vulnerable, and increasing risk of reaching adaptation limits to adaptation. Climate impacts now and in the future increasingly challenge the adaptive capacity of society and ecosystems. Three special reports reconfirm the urgent need for immediate reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Such immediate reductions would provide the world with much more space for cost-effective and sustainable mitigation and adaptation options. Immediate reductions would generate opportunities for investment in innovation and technologies, for higher productivity in energy and resource use, in alternative technologies for a world free of human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, and for investment in know-how for achieving equitable transitions. These investments would generate powerful benefits spilling over to all sectors of the society and the economy, making them cleaner, healthier, and more resilient. And they would help achieve societal goals of poverty eradication and sustainable development. The failure to achieve such immediate emissions reductions will give the world the opposite of all this, in addition to the cascading impacts of a worsening climate. The world will suffer from stranded assets, the legacy of business as usual investment. The financial sector above all will face greater uncertainty due to risks from climate change and climate change policy. Food security will be threatened as a result of worsening climate and increased competition for land arising from the need to use land as a vehicle for mitigations. The world will face increased risk of losses by biodiversity and ecosystem services. And as a result, 
the sustainable development goals such as zero poverty, zero hunger, and life on Earth will be compromised. There will be little room for ecosystem-based adaptation, blue carbon ecosystems, sustainable fisheries, and sustainable land management, as these adaptation options are effective only under low emission pathways. As Executive Secretary Espinoza has said, if we stay on our current path, we risk a sharp rise in global temperature increase this century, and I quote, this will have enormous negative consequences for humanity and threaten our existence on this planet. We need an immediate and urgent change in trajectory. Achieving it is absolutely necessary to the health, safety, security of everyone of this planet, on this planet, both in the short and long term, unquote. The IPCC findings support your conclusions. Later this week, we will be discussing our two latest special reports at Substar IPCC special events. Both this special report on land and special report on oceans and cryosphere confirm that climate change will continue to exacerbate poverty and undermine the livelihoods of the poor and the marginalized. Both point to the need for immediate reductions in greenhouse gas emissions if we are to stabilize the climate. They should serve as a wake-up call to all of us. These reports have an extraordinary resonance, transforming public awareness of climate change and highlighting the importance of an all-of-society response. We are humbled that our work is reaching beyond you, our core audience of national governments, policymakers, and negotiators, and beyond the scientific community to other stakeholders at the local and regional level, decision makers in cities, business and industry, civil society as a whole, young people, and the public at large. But despite this enhanced understanding of climate change, it is very clear we are not doing anywhere near enough to tackle it, just as I said at the beginning of this my statement. I assure you that IPCC is working hard to deliver the scientific evidence you need. We are now midway through the sixth assessment cycle. The work is advancing on the main sixth assessment report that will be delivered in 2021. We will have a synthesis report which will integrate the three AR6 main reports and the three special reports you already have that will be ready in May 2022. The synthesis report will provide policymakers and negotiators with the most up-to-date synthesis of scientific knowledge on climate change as you prepare for the first global stock take in 2023. It is my hope that this synthesis report will also help integrate our understanding of climate change and policy response. This will require inputs both from the science and policy communities. We appreciate very much the complexities of taking climate action, arising from the need to address the consequences of action as, as well as its processes. We appreciate the challenge you face as a catalyst for the unprecedented change the society will need in the very short term as well as for the long term. Please tell us what you need from us and we, the scientific community, will work with you to mend the disconnect between the scientific understanding of climate change and the realities of climate action. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Lee. As president of COP25, 
I should like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you here today. I should like to thank you for being here, for your commitment, a commitment that is vital, that is urgent. It is only by standing shoulder to shoulder, by working together, that we can truly tackle the greatest challenge that is facing us today across the entire globe. That is, of course, climate change. I personally have a great deal of trust and hope in this new COP. The spirit of collaboration and cooperation which we shall need has been here present since the very outset. Today, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the committed work that's been done in solidarity and in coordination with the teams of Chile and Spain. My thanks to Spain. My thanks to Prime Minister Sanchez. My thanks to Mr. Rivera and all the Spaniards who have received us, hosted us here in solidarity and in firm conviction that we shall stand together and face this climate emergency. President Sebastián Piñera is not here with us and will not be able to accompany us at this COP25 for reasons which are well known. But he did want to send some words of welcome, which I would like to share with you now. Muy buenos días. Good morning. Welcome to COP25, a COP in which many of us have worked so hard for so long and with so much conviction and commitment to make it a turning point and a great leap forward in the protection of our planet Earth and for a better life for us, our children, grandchildren and those who will come. I want to thank from the bottom of my heart Spain and its authorities for welcoming this COP25 into their home and for their generosity and solidarity with Chile. Chile's commitment with the fight against global warming is firm, clear and permanent. That is why it hurts for me not to be in Madrid today. But today, my duty and responsibility is to be in Chile facing the hard times that we have been through. Chile was one of Spain's poorest colonies in Latin America. However, the past 30 years have been very fruitful. We recovered our democracy. We have achieved great economic and social progress that today places us at the head of Latin America in economic and human development. However, in the past six weeks, we have experienced three simultaneous but very different situations. First, a wave of criminal violence that we have faced with democratic instruments and the rule of law, safeguarding the human rights of all people. Any deviation from these principles is being investigated by the prosecutor's office and will be judged by the courts of justice as is appropriate in a democracy governed by the rule of law. Second, a great and legitimate demand of our citizens for greater social justice, which we are confronting with a powerful social agenda. And third, the search for a new social pact that we are facing with an agreement for a new constitution. We are sure that with the unity and greatness that has always characterized the Chilean people, we will overcome these difficult times and come out strengthened as a democratic country with more social justice and fully respectful of all human rights. Just as I am sure that humanity will know how to overcome this climate crisis and act with the will, courage and urgency that these times and challenges require. Science has spoken loud and clear. We need more ambitious climate commitments in much shorter time frames than those agreed in Paris. Young people have also spoken loud and clear. They are challenging and demanding us that we take on our moral commitment to protect our planet and ensure the survival of human life on Earth. Our citizens ask and demand us that we face this cause with greater unity, will and ambition. Nature implores us to take care of her so that she can take care of us. We know too much to remain skeptical. We have the necessary science, the technology and the tools to act. 
The time for diagnostics is over. The time for action has come. I am sure that this COP25 will be a turning point from the past and a great leap forward towards a healthier planet and a better future and life for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. It is now my pleasure to invite His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, to address the plenary. Excellencies, honorable guests, delegates, all protocol observed. Quiero agradecer a los I should like to thank the governments of Chile and Spain for working together in the spirit of inclusive multilateralism to make COP25 possible. I should like to commend them on their impeccable organization, which has been achieved in such a short space of time. My very heartfelt congratulations and thank you. Such solidarity and flexibility are what we need in the race to beat the climate emergency. We stand at a critical juncture in our collective efforts to limit dangerous global heating. By the end of the coming decade, we will be on one of two paths. One is the path of surrender, where we have sleepwalked past the point of no return jeopardizing the health and safety of everyone on this planet. Do we really want to be remembered as the generation that buried its head in the sand, that fiddled while the planet burned? The other option is the path of hope, a path of resolve, of sustainable solutions, a path where more fossil fuels remain where they should be, in the ground, and where we are on the way to carbon neutrality by 2050. That is the only way to limit global temperature rise to the necessary 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. The best available science through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tell us today that going beyond that would lead us to catastrophic disaster. Millions throughout the world, especially young people, are calling on leaders from all sectors to do more, much more, to address the climate emergency we face. They know we need to get on the right path today, not tomorrow. And that means important decisions must be made now, and COP25 is our opportunity. Dear delegates, before I focus on what I believe we need to do at this session, let me step back to give a sense of perspective to our deliberations. The latest just related data from the World Meteorological Organization show that levels of heat trapping greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have reached another record high. Global average levels of carbon dioxide reached 407.8 parts per million in 2018. And I remember not long ago 400 parts per million was seen as an unthinkable tipping point. We are, way, we are well over it. The last time there was a comparable concentration of CO2 was between 3 and 5 million years ago, when the temperature was between 2 and 3 degrees Celsius warmer than now, and sea levels were 10 to 20 meters higher than today. The signs are unmissable. The last five years have been the hottest ever recorded. The consequences are already making themselves felt in the form of more extreme weather events and associated disasters, from hurricanes to drought to floods to wildfires. Ice caps are melting. In Greenland alone, 179 billion tons of ice melted in July. Permafrost in the Arctic is towing 60, 70 years ahead of projections. 
and Antarctica is melting three times as fast as a decade ago. Ocean levels are rising quicker than expected, putting some of our biggest and most economically important cities at risk. More than two-thirds of the world's megacities are located by the sea. And while the oceans are rising, they are also being poisoned. Oceans absorb more than a quarter of our CO2 in the atmosphere and generate more than half of our oxygen. Absorbing more and more carbon dioxide acidifies the oceans and threatens all life within them. Three major reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on land, on the oceans and cryosphere, and on the 1.5 degrees Celsius climate goal each confirm that we are knowingly destroying the very support systems keeping us alive. And indeed, we are. In several regions of the world, coal power plants continue to be planned and built in large numbers. Either we stop this addiction to coal, or all our efforts to tackle climate change will be doomed. And as the UN Environment Programme has just revealed, countries are planning to produce fossil fuels over the next decade at over double the level that is consistent with keeping themselves temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the fossil fuel industry is not alone. From agriculture to transportation, from urban planning and construction to cement, steel and other carbon intensive industries, we are far from a sustainable path. We see some incremental steps towards sustainable business models, but nowhere near the scope and scale required. What we need is not an incremental approach, but a transformational one. We need a rapid and deep change in the way we do business, how we generate power, how we build cities, how we move, and how we feed the world. If we don't urgently change our way of life, we jeopardize life itself. For the past year, I've been saying we need to make progress on carbon pricing, shift taxation from income to carbon, ensure no new coal plants are built after 2020, and then the allocation of taxpayers' money for perverse fossil fuel subsidies. We must also ensure that the transition to a green economy is a just transition one that recognizes the need to care for the future of negatively impacted workers in terms of new jobs, lifelong education, and social safety nets. If we want change, we must be that change. Choosing the path of hope is not the job of one person, one industry, or one government alone. We are all in this together. And the roadmap established by the scientific community is clear. To limit global temperature rise to the necessary 1.5 degrees by the end of this century, we must reduce emissions by 45% from 2010 levels by 2030, and we must achieve climate neutrality by 2050. Ten years ago, if countries had acted on the science available, they would have needed to reduce emissions by 3.3% each year. We didn't. And today we need to reduce emissions by 7.6% each year to reach our goals. So it is imperative that governments not only honor their national contributions under the Paris Agreement, they need to substantially increase their ambitions. And even if the Paris commitments are fully met, it would not be enough. But unfortunately, many countries are not even doing that, and results are there to be seen. According to the latest emissions gap report from the UN Environmental Programme, greenhouse gas emissions have risen 1.5% a year over the last decade. At current trends, we are looking at global heating of between 3.5 and 3.9 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. The impact on all life on the planet, including ours, would be catastrophic. The only solution is rapid, ambitious, transformative action by all – governments, regions, cities, businesses and civil society – all working together towards a common goal. 
And that was the purpose of the Climate Action Summit I convened in September. And in many ways it was encouraging. Small island nations and least developed countries, major cities and regional economies, all came with initiatives as did a sizable representation from the private and financial sectors. Some 70 countries announced their intention to submit enhanced national contributions in 2020, with 65 countries and major subnational economies committing to work for net zero emissions by 2050. And I'm pleased to see governments and investors backing away from fossil fuels. A recent example is the European Investment Bank, which has announced it will stop funding fossil fuel projects by the end of 2021. But we are still waiting for transformative movement from most G20 countries, which represent more than three quarters of global emissions. My new report on the summit sets out what needs to be done going forward. Primarily, all the main emitters must do more. This means enhancing their national determined contributions in 2020 under the Paris Agreement, presenting a carbon neutrality strategy for 2050, and embarking on the decarbonization of key sectors, particularly energy, industry, construction, and transport. Without the full engagement of the big emitters, all our efforts will be undermined. A green economy is not one to be feared, but an opportunity to be embraced, and one that can advance our efforts to achieve all the sustainable development goals. But what frustrates me, and I believe what frustrates us all, is the slow pace of change, especially given that most of the tools and technologies we need are already available. So my call to you all today is to increase your ambition and your urgency. Dear delegates, we are here at COP25 to reach progress on key items, namely achieving success on Article 6 and continuing to boost ambition in preparation for new and revised national climate action plans due next year. Article 6 was the outstanding issue not resolved at COP24 in Katowice. To put a price on carbon is vital if you are to have any chance of limiting global temperature rise and avoiding runaway climate change. And operationalizing Article 6 will help get markets up and running, mobilize the private sector and ensure that the rules are the same for everyone. Failure to operationalize Article 6 risks fragmenting the carbon markets and sends a negative message that can undermine our overall climate efforts. I urge all parties to overcome their current divisions and to find common understanding on this issue. And the COP will also advance work related to capacity building, deforestation, indigenous peoples, cities, finance, technology, gender and more. The COP must complete several technical matters to achieve the full operationalization of the transparency framework under the Paris Agreement. The tasks are many, the timelines are tight, every item is important. And it is imperative to complete our work and we have no time to spare. But as important as the successful conclusion of negotiations, the COP25 must convey to the world a firm determination to change course. We must finally demonstrate that we are serious in our commitment to stop the war against nature, that we have the political will to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. I expect all governments will be able to commit now to review during this next year on the way to COP26 in Glasgow their national determined contributions with the necessary ambition to defeat the climate, to defeat the climate emergency. Ambition in mitigation, ambition in adaptation, and ambition in finance. Let us not forget, we should ensure that at least 100 billion US dollars a year are available to development countries for mitigation and adaptation, and take into account their legitimate expectations to have the resources necessary to build resilience and for disaster response and recovery. Dear delegates, the decisions we make here will ultimately define whether we choose a path of hope 
or a passive surrender. And remember, we made a commitment to the people of the world through the Paris Agreement, and it was a solemn promise. Let us open our ears to the multitudes who are demanding change. Let us open our eyes to the imminent threat facing us all. Let us open our minds to the unanimity of the science. There is no time and no reason to delay. We have the tools, we have the science, we have the resources. Let us show we also have the political will that people demand from us. To do anything less will be a betrayal of our entire human family and all the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Secretary General. I now wish to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Pedro Sánchez, Prime Minister of Spain, with the special thanks of uh, Chile to the Government of Spain for their cooperation and the tremendous efforts made in hosting this conference. You have the floor, sir. One hundred and sixty-two years ago, in 1857, the American Journal of Science published a curious scientific report upholding an original thesis. An atmosphere of CO2 would give to our Earth a high temperature, and if, as some suppose, at one period of its history the air had mixed with it a larger proportion than at present, an increased temperature must have necessarily resulted. The origin of this research was in an ingenious experiment with thermometers, glass cylinders, and a vacuum pump. Somebody theorized for the first time about the existence of the greenhouse effect. This somebody had a name, and it was a woman's name, Eunice Foote. However, the person who publicly um, demonstrated this discovery was not her, but rather her colleague, Professor jo Joseph Henry. The reason is a simple one. Women did not have permission to expose scientific discoveries at the time. One century and a half went by until her contribution was recognized. I wanted to begin by evoking Eunice Foote's memory for two reasons. Firstly, to revive her memory and the memory of so many other female scientists to rescue them from the injustice of oblivion and forgetting. The second is to highlight that all of the time that's gone by since science first warned us. This double paradox invites us to reflect. For decades and decades, progress has been built on the shoulders of women, half of humankind, and this progress has been understood without taking into account the physical limits that make human life viable on our planet. Women and the environment, environment and women, there are two realities that have been ignored for too long and without which the future and indeed the present of mankind would be unimaginable. Ladies and gentlemen, delegates, welcome one and all to Spain, welcome one and all to Madrid. This open country, this cosmopolitan city receives you with hospitality and affection, but above all with hope, the hope that this summit will mark a before and an after. Madrid, for a few days, will be the global capital of the fight against climate change and indeed against the climate emergency. And it will also be the home of strengthened multilateralism. It will be the home of a renewed climate ambition and true commitment to action for the planet. But above all, Madrid wishes to be the capital of dialogue and words. Dialogue among countries as we are here meeting united against a common enemy to all of humankind and indeed dialogue with society. Over 1,500 civil society organizations are with us, hundreds of companies committed to fulfilling the sustainable development goals, and millions of voices from an entire generation of young people who refuse to sit down and be quiet in the face of the growing degradation of our planet. All of them wish to take the floor. All of them don't want to, they don't want to be a mere annex or appendices to this summit. They 
don't want to be in a forum of parallel side events. They want to be crucial actors and stakeholders in the face of the massive challenge that we have before us. They have a right to take the floor. Our duty is to listen to their message. Madrid will also be a host, and as I want to stress, this is the host of the Chilean presidency. Chile is the president of this COP. Chile has organized this summit and with huge efforts of leadership, and they are the ones who've driven the Alliance for uh, Climate Ambition, which is something that I want to recognize here today. I also publicly want to recognize the extraordinary work done by one country, by Chile, a country with which Spain shares so many links. The success of this meeting will be above all the success of Chile. Distinguished delegates, we know that today, if progress isn't sustainable, we can't call it progress. Today, we have the scientific certainty that man is behind the damage done to the fragile balance permitting life on our planet. But we also know that it is up to man to repair the harm caused and to put an end to this harm so we can guarantee the future. And we have the technology to make that possible. For years, various irrational versions of climate denial were circulating. Some were even saying they were conspiracies and dictatorships of supposed political correctness. How luckily today only a handful of fanatics denied the evidence. Time has proven that in the face of alternative facts that some invoke to deny the climate emergency, there is nothing more to be done other than to act on the facts that we have. The war against the climate emergency requires courage and determination. It requires solidarity and leadership. But above all, it requires facts. It requires that we move from words to action. It requires events. It requires things being done. 2018, once again, as the representative of the IPCC said, the 2018 has seen the maximum, the highest levels of concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Just a few days ago, the UNEP emissions gap report warned about the uh, the increase there. This worrying data risking the Paris Agreement goals of limiting to 1.5 the increase of temperatures with regards pre-industrial levels is, as I said, extremely concerned. We all know what concerning. We all know what this involves. We have to go further, and we have to go more quickly. We either need a turning point, or we need to leave behind, the, or we go past the point of no return. Reaching climate neutrality in 2015 requires audaciousness. It requires us to work from a new multilateralism. Nobody can sidestep this challenge. There is no wall high enough to protect us from this threat. And the time for a response is now. We must get to the Glasgow summit in 2020 with national contributions, which are much more ambitious, long-term strategies, which will lead to ordered, just, and efficient decarbonization. Spain stands ready to take this step. We will honor the words that we have given in the past with more action and more climate ambition. We are going to step up the speed of emissions reduction that we've committed to by 2030. And we will do this with one premise, which I think is important to share with you, and that is to not leave anyone behind. With a coherent green pact, which is aligned with the goals set out by the European Union. A great agreement to equitably shoulder the impact of this transformation, re transformation which is required by our economies. A great green deal, an agreement to bring together innovation, digitalization, and dignified employment. Just And together with women in the environment, this is the third powerful idea which should inspire our action. This is the roadmap set out by the new president of the European Commission in her speech last week, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, and I thank her for being in Madrid today. In a time which has been marked by the silence of some, Europe has a lot to say in this war, in this fight. First of all, because our societies require it and are 
seeking it, but also because of a, an issue of fundamental historic justice. If it was Europe which led the Industrial Revolution and fossil capitalism, then it must be Europe which leads decarbonisation. We are on the threshold of a transition, and this transition that we are called upon to take forward is not only urgent, but it must be just. If we've learned anything from globalization, it must be that there can be no losers in this transformation because the defeat of some is the defeat of all. The ecological transition must be a gear shift lever against inequality. It must involve justice and equity. Spain has shouldered this mandate with determination and is resolutely planning to act. We believe in the value of multilateralism and all the policies that all countries need to put in place and the fact that they all need to be aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals, marking the 2030 Agenda, a new social global contract for a changing world. And let us echo the message from the recent New York Summit. We must strengthen the coalition of social and political drivers. A task from the United Nations Secretary General, who I thank from the bottom of my heart for his leadership and commitment to this cause. Ladies and gentlemen, ambition has always been one of the drivers of the human spirit. We had the ambition to explore the far reaches of space. We had the ambition to defy the limits of scientific knowledge. Let us harness that same ambition to preserve the fragile balance enabling life in the only home that we have on our own planet. Let me invite you to make this meeting a milestone in the fight against the climate emergency. Let us make the policies and what they really should be an ethical multiplier to bring together the will and to win this fight. We need to lead by example. We need to act resolutely guided by the great ideas that inspire the responses to mankind's, the humankind's challenges, gender equality, social justice and sustainability. Humankind has reached a point, ladies and gentlemen, where we have to bid for our survival and that in, equates to fighting for a better world. This is our challenge so that the future generations, when they look back, can say that at this critical point that humankind truly rose to the challenge. Thank you very much indeed. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much indeed, Your Excellency. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. This brings us to the end of the ceremonial opening of COP25. Before concluding, I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to those who've been working to make sure that we can all be here, to the president of IFEMA, Mr. Clemente Gonzalez Soler, to the director general of IFEMA, Mr. Eduardo Lopez Puertas Pitoabe, and to the entire staff of IFEMA for their generosity, for their hard work, and their unwavering commitment. And indeed, to the team from the Secretariat of UNFCCC who have been working tirelessly to ensure that our meeting is a, a success. Together with the government of Spain, and thanks to them, we are here at COP25 today. Thank you all very much. Please do remain in your seats while the dignitaries leave. Thank you.